Hi everyone. Uh, thanks very much for having me today. Uh, so as uh, in my introduction, I'm a graphics editor at the New York Times, which means I report, write, design, and develop stories that are best told visually. Uh, my background's in data visualization, um, but I often get um, the opportunity to work on multimedia-rich projects that combine photos and videos too. Um, so Dan asked me today to speak to you specifically about one story that we published last year called How the Virus Won. So I'm going to go through the process of how we generally gathered and analyzed data for that story before looping back to talk a little bit about uncertainty in that project and a couple of others throughout the pandemic. So if we all think back to April 2020, uh, this was a time when so much was unknown about the virus, um, but a few things were starting to become clear. Around the world, lockdowns and stay-at-home orders were being introduced to try and slow the spread. And we knew that the confirmed case numbers were just the tip of the iceberg, especially in the US where testing was severely limited. Um, and this is when we started working on how the virus won. Um, we started out with a few key questions that basically the whole world was grappling with, but we wanted to try and tackle in one um, data-rich story. Uh, so that was basically how instrumental was international and domestic travel to the spread of the virus? How many hidden infections were there, especially early on? What was the cost of official slow reaction to the outbreak? And were social distancing measures effective? So we connected with academics and different companies who could help us with providing data um, in order to answer these questions. Uh, so this is um, a video of one part of the visualization for people who haven't seen it. Uh, we call this a kind of scrolly telling format. So the, the visualization stays in the background um, and different animations bring in different data sets uh, with the text scrolling on top of it. Um, I'll show you some more videos throughout for the people who haven't seen it. But in order to kind of start building this project out, it was really crucial for us to form relationships with leading researchers um, across the world. Uh, so one of those was Alessandro Vespignani here at Northeastern. Uh, really early on, he provided us estimates of the number of infected travelers who came into the US, as well as the number of infections that were being missed in those official case counts. Uh, we also worked with Jeffrey Shaman at Columbia, um, and his modeling was crucial for us to know how contagious domestic travelers were and how many deaths could have been avoided with earlier restrictions. Um, but then we also conducted a lot of um, complex data analyses ourselves. Um, so one thing that we thought we could tackle was to start to understand the impact of social distancing measures and how domestic travel allowed early outbreaks to spread. Uh, so we partnered up with a data insights company called Cubic. Um, they agreed to send us daily files with um, two different metrics of data. Um, but if you think about them, are really crucial to understand how people were moving around the US. Uh, so we, for each county in the US, we knew the average number of meters that someone was moving around uh, day by day. And we knew the number of journeys that people were making between two, any two different counties. Um, so we knew that this data could really help us understand how key domestic travel was to the early spread of the virus. So as data journalists, we dug in. Um, so this is just one chart of some of our key early analysis. Um, this is just a scatter plot. On the x-axis, we've got the number of arrivals, people coming from New York. On the y-axis, it's the number of cases on April 11th. Every dot represents one county in the US. Um, so we found that travel from New York City early in the pandemic predicted those early case rates really, really well. Um, this chart itself never made it into the final piece, um, but it sparked a whole chain of reporting. So the way we would work is that we would um, do our own analyses, and then we would send them to the epidemiologists and geneticists that we formed relationships with. You know, we'd ask for their input and we'd find out whether it matched the work that they were doing. As it turned out, our analysis of the travel data was one of the earliest signals that New York City was acting as a gateway for the virus in the US. And that was later confirmed by researchers tracking the genetic mutations of the virus. So a variant that was found in New York showed up um, much more widely across the country than the early virus that was found in Seattle. So having someone else working um, with completely different data and find the same results is a good way to know that you're on the right lines. So this travel analysis become a really central part of how the virus won, um, especially when we combined it with those estimates of how contagious travelers were. Um, here you can see that each blue dot is a traveler leaving New York 
and the red dots is the number of travelers that we estimated to be uh, contagious with coronavirus at the time. And then we did a lot of reporting around these key dates so that we bring in the Bill de Blasio on March 2nd saying, I'm encouraging New Yorkers to go on with your lives and get out on the town. So we know there were 10,000 infections in New York City by then. And I think juxtaposing that um, politician statement downplaying the outbreak against you seeing the, the coronavirus seeping into counties across the country is very powerful. So alongside this data analysis, we were also doing the design and development work to bring this story to life. Um, so the development itself was all done in JavaScript using a library called 3JS. Uh, so it allows us to create 3D graphics on the web. And that's how we got those really seamless uh, camera angle changes and animations to work. Um, but then we were also doing our data analyses and early visualization sketching in R. Um, so we had R scripts that would read in the latest data from our sources, you know, the researchers from Cubic, um, and also the New York Times database of coronavirus cases. Uh, and then we would feed that into clean data files that the project could use. And, but really the hardest part of this whole project was keeping the underlying visualizations clear, but also consistent. So because we were using so many different data sets, um, all that maybe had different timeframes and different caveats, um, we wanted to keep it as simple as possible and not use vastly different visuals for each section. We think that would have added a lot of overhead for readers as they acclimatized themselves with each new graphic. So we had to think really creatively about how we could communicate each data set's findings using the kind of dot pattern that we'd established. Um, and then thinking about uncertainty in this project, um, one of the main aims was to show how much uncertainty there was in the official data itself. So those confirmed case counts on the trackers that we've all been obsessed with for the past 18 months. Um, this project really shone a light on just how they were, um, just the tip of the iceberg. Um, and especially in those early days, they were complete undercounts of what was happening. But obviously we were very aware that those estimates that we got from researchers had their own uncertainties. Um, and one way that we think we helped combat uncertainty with this piece um, was by choosing a visual format that by its own design was kind of imprecise. You know, dot clouds and flowing dots of travelers don't allow readers to read off exact values, but they still convey a sense of scale and relative magnitude. So for example, here on the graphic on screen, you can't see exactly how many infected travelers went from New York to DC, but you can see that DC was one of the top destinations for New York. Um, and similarly to what Cheeky said, um, uncertainty isn't just conveyed in the visualizations, but also in the writing. Um, so we um, received those modeling outputs, but they were medians, and that we were also provided with the upper and lower bounds. So when we did cite estimates and exact numbers, we made sure to round them to match the level of uncertainty in those bounds. So, you know, if it was between 8,200 and 9,800 hidden infections, we'd have probably rounded that to about 9,000. So that sends a signal to your readers um, that there is some imprecision in your findings. Um, now I'm just gonna try and jump and talk more broadly about some um, uncertainty um, techniques that we found worked really well over the past 18 months. And um, we do use traditional techniques such as error bars and confidence intervals that you find in academic literature. Um, but we also have to design for a really broad audience. So we found some different techniques that can work really well. Uh, so I'm gonna share them with you now. Uh, so one thing that we've used repeatedly is this idea of scenarios. Um, here, my colleagues were trying to present a, a model of when the US might reach herd immunity. Um, and we again worked with the modeler and he gave us his best estimate. He said sometime in the summer would be when the US might reach herd immunity. Um, but we all know that that estimate varies by so many different factors. So throughout the piece, um, we explained that a new variant, a change to social distancing measures or an increase in the vaccine supply would vastly affect um, how those um, estimates play out. So we created an interactive each of those factors readers could tap toggle between three different options and see how it would affect the herd immunity estimates. So as you can see, a more contagious variant like we got with Delta brought forward that date when we think the threshold would be met. Um, and then by presenting those multiple scenarios, you show readers that there are different ways that this could play out. You also let readers understand that factors, um, what factors will determine what happens next. And you don't show that there is uncertainty, but why there is uncertainty. Um, a nice simple one here, 
Um, if the value is uncertain or if you're making an estimation, uh, it's okay to show the range of values. Uh, we wanted to plot here uh, how infectious and how um, the fatality rate of coronavirus might compare to other viruses in circulation. Um, but we weren't sure and we worked with researchers and we got their best estimates and, and we plotted the range. Um, we didn't feel the need to plot a median or a best estimate, we just plotted the range. So that's always a great option if you uh, are in a similar situation. And then finally, uh, something I'm a big fan of is if you're working with um, medians, you can always show the distribution of values as well as the average. Um, so this was a piece where we looked at the effect of stay at home orders on the reduction in travel in the early days of the pandemic. Um, and we, we, we did a model and we found a statistically significant result. So we could have just plotted the averages. But by showing the underlying county data here, where every circle is a different county, you know, we convey so much more to the reader. We show them the wide variation that exists in each group, as well as marking those crucial averages, which is the, the point of the story. Um, so we call these these one plots. Um, and I think they're a really great way of showing a distribution, um, especially for county and country data, um, without relying on something like histograms, which um, more readers are maybe not familiar with. Um, so I think that's all I've got time for for now, but I'd be happy to take your question shortly.